I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about testing with your OBGYN or your RE. So if you've been trying to conceive for one year and you're under 35 or six months and over 35, what are some basic tests that need to be run with um, before you go to the fertility clinic? So we're talking about hormone tests. We're talking about structural tests for both you and your partner and what we see that can be missed and also about empowering yourself as well with education and knowing your test results before you embark on this journey. So excited for you to listen to this podcast and thanks for being here. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take the few minutes right now, you can pause this, this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up, sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. And melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. There's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent uh, frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. So I got to say I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day and I have to say after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast at check out and receive a 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code GETPREGNANTPODCAST to receive your 15% discount. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. 
It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with fertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Georgie Kovacs to the podcast, and we're digging into what questions to ask your doctor when you are trying to conceive. Georgie Kovacs is an MBA and is the founder of FemPower Health, which she founded after her firsthand experience with infertility. Leveraging this experience along with her 20-year tenure in the biopharmaceutical industry and consulting, she leads this movement. So thanks so much for listening, and I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe, and if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Georgie, excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks, Sarah, for having me. I'm excited to be here and, and talk to you today. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, first of all, can you share your, your own journey and how you came to do this work? Sure. Um, so 10 years ago, I had just returned from my honeymoon and I happened to have an OBGYN appointment. Didn't think anything of it. It was just my annual exam. And she did ask me some questions about trying to conceive, but again, I didn't think anything of it. And she calls me the next day, I believe it was, and said I had to go to a fertility doctor. So I hadn't even started trying. Mm. I've been in the healthcare industry my entire life. I was a chemistry major, so I know the science very well, but fertility was a whole different ball game. I was just absolutely floored with what was ahead of me. Um, so I spent the next three years going to 10 of the best reproductive endocrinologists trying to conceive. And I finally did get pregnant. I did have the journey of unexplained infertility for three of those years until they figured out that I had endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And I had the laparoscopic surgery and got pregnant first try after that. And through the journey, I started getting involved in advocacy work and then things started picking up with social media and Facebook groups with you know things like PCOS and all these different conditions. And I just really started to observe the market. And I always knew I wanted to start a business. And my um, long-term wish has been you know, on my tombstone, I wanted to say that I made a difference. And so I've been on this journey to figure out how I can make a difference. And when I saw you know, that my story was you know, not unique, and that so many women have the same issue, which is years and years of trying to find an answer, having a hard time finding an answer. Um, I knew I had to do something. And originally, I started on the path of trying to help women who are struggling to conceive. But after years of this, what finally hit me is it's not just an issue with infertility, it's women's health more broadly. Mm. And so I've made the transition more recently to FemPower Health, which more supports women overall in trying to get support and answers more quickly for these unnecessarily long health journeys that they go through. I think I saw something today on your Instagram about that, about the different, about, yeah, there was a quote, here it is. Um, we have used men as our model for health and disease, and we have this assumption that it's, it's close enough to apply to women. That does not turn out well for women's health. Yes, that is from our podcast interview with Dr. Allison McGregor, and she wrote a book about sex matters, and she also has a TED Talk, which has 1.5 million downloads. And what was interesting is when she started her work, she was trying to share it at a medical conference and no one attended. And now 1.5 million people have downloaded her yeah. TED Talk. So I think it's becoming apparent to what you're saying. I think one of the things that became apparent to me, and you know, like I said, I've been in healthcare 
Um, I've worked 10 years as a consultant, half of it on the clinical side of the business, so meaning like the clinical trials, et cetera. And the issue is there's just not enough uh, funding for women's health and to put data behind it. And I think this is important because, you know, there, you know, a lot of women are trying to conceive and I want it to be clear that, you know, just because there are things like IVF available, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to achieve your goal. So whether or not you're trying to get pregnant, it's important to figure out what's going on with you. But especially if you're trying to conceive, you need to know what's going on with you. And I think it's important for women to know that it can be a journey and it's not because doctors don't want to help. It's because there isn't enough data because the funding isn't there. The clinical trials aren't there. And to bring it home, I'm going to try to remember the exact number. It's um, on the FemPower Health website. So if I get it wrong, but you'll get the gist of what I'm trying to say. So when you look at the cost burden to the financial system relative to the NIH funding for a given disease, for diabetes, it's 350 to 1. And for endometriosis, it's 13,000 to one. And what that translates to is the burden of disease for endometriosis is so vast, yet the funding is barely there. And when you look at diabetes, there's clinical trial after clinical trial and new drug after new drug. There would be joke at many conferences that I go to where if men had endometriosis, we'd have a cure today. Um, you know, and to Allison's point, like, again, it's not that people don't care. I think, you know, when you've had a lot of men in medicine, they just don't think about it. Um, and now that more and more women are starting to get into research, into medicine, I think we have the power to change. And, and that's why, honestly, Fem Power Health focuses on the consumer and not the medical system. Because I think, you know, the more we can help the consumer, I think that's where a lot of the change is going to happen in healthcare. Yeah, I interviewed the director for Endo What, and um, she was talking in there about yeah Endo taking ten to I think it's ten to eleven years to even diagnose women yep. being dismissed with pain, having period pain, you know that's that's crippling, and being told, oh, don't worry about it, it's just your period. So she's really on a, a mission to educate, starting it in in high schools with with the with the high school nurse to be like, okay, wait yep. a minute, you see someone presenting with this, you know, this is what it could be, and women girls are, you know, suffering for years and years with this and then trying to get pregnant. And there's, you know, things that can be do with early intervention and really empowering. Um, yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it, but it's not just endo. So I know that, you know, yeah. I know endo best because obviously I had it, but like, take a look at PCOS, you know, how many times do I hear girls going into a doctor, they're struggling to um, lose weight and they're losing their hair. And a lot of times it's, oh, go on birth control and call me when you want to get pregnant. Meanwhile, they're suffering with all of these symptoms and, you know, the wrong birth control can actually have negative impacts and just put the, the disease into hiding and not actually help the woman in the long run. Or then when you look at thyroid disease, a lot of people are misdiagnosed. Um, if you look at the, I think it's Thyroid Association or something like that, one of the advocacy groups for thyroid disease, they, um, I think it's American Thyroid Association actually. And, you know, they report how a ridiculous number of people, I think it, is it 60%? I mean, it was a really, really high percentage of people who are undiagnosed. And one of the issues is there's disagreement with the experts around what a normal TSH level is. And I know some of the fertility clinics, I believe um, Yale, they discovered that a lot of women ended up having Hashimoto's disease. And so they regularly do a full thyroid panel. I mean, I hear many stories of women who have issues and the doctor's convinced it's not the thyroid and the woman comes in and begs and pleads and demands for further testing. And sometimes the doctors are like, wow, you know, I'm so sorry, I should have done this test. And so women really need to be aware of this. And I'm not, not at all advocating get everything tested. But you know, if there are these issues, you have every right to ask for this information because you know, it's not fair that you wait years. I mean, look at me. I got pregnant at 40 and now I'm supposed to try to have kids again. I mean, how is that going to happen? I'm, I'm, you know, my eggs are older. And if they would have diagnosed me earlier, I'd have a larger family. 
Yeah, we see this all the time with thyroid dysfunction and people just being focused on the TSH. Where we're looking at full thyroid panels, including antibodies and the functional approach and digging into people are being told, yeah, TSH at five is normal or maybe you know above five and you go on medication or well, for fertility, typically below two or, or 1.5. And again, we're not just focusing on the TSH. Looking at the T3 and T4, we see a lot of people with either hypothyroidism, subclinical thyroid issues. So it's not actually the uh, thyroid, it's other things going on in the body, gut infections, food sensitivities, and then undiagnosed uh, Hashimoto's or Graves. So that, that looking at the thyroid is key. And then also, yeah, like you're talking about, I speak to a lot of women who, when I ask if, when, you know, if you've been on the pill, and a lot of people that I see have been on long-term hormonal birth control for 10, 15 years. And, and now going off and, and having to deal, have to deal with infertility, not to say that everyone that goes on the pill is then going to deal with infertility. But when I asked them, did you go on, on for prevention or, you know, was there something else going on, like irregular periods, acne, um, heavy periods, and most people went on because there was something going on. And the, the, the first line of defense for, for a doctor typically is like, let's put you on the pill. And those issues don't go away. It's a, it's a Band-Aid approach. So, and then you're dealing with post-birth control pill syndrome, like, people that are, then it predisposes you to food sensitivities, gut infections, you know, you're eating a healthy diet and your body's not able to absorb those nutrients. So we see this all the time and it's really to dig further and be your own advocate. So that's what I wanted to talk to you today about really how do we empower ourselves with information so we really know our body. And when we, you know, we're in the driver's seat for this and it's not just, you know, you, you, you go to your OBGYN or you go to your RE, but also um, your fertility coach, your nutritionist, your acupuncturist, Cairo, but you're in the middle and you know your body best. So with that, what are some, some tests that we should be asking for if we've been you know, trying to conceive for a year, um, if we're over 35 for, for six months, what are some, some tests that you're, that you're seeing? You know, obviously, so I would say, you know, not everyone has to go straight to a reproductive endocrinologist, mm -hmm. but there's basic testing that, you know, does need to be done. And the ASRM or American Society for Reproductive Medicine website has those lists. But generally speaking, you know, women will have, you know, basic workups. And I haven't seen issues with the basic workups when I've interviewed women across the country, you know, things like the hormone testing, like testing for the FSH, LH, estradiol, DHEAs. I don't know if a lot of, if every single OBGYN may test for these, but a lot of these should be done at your OBGYN office. And total testosterone is another one that ASRM recommends. And then progesterone, this is one where, you know, I started to get to know Amy Beckley and she is the founder of Prove and they do progesterone testing. And this is an interesting one because I know when I was in my journey, I had to go in for what was called like my day 21 blood work. So midway between in your luteal phase, that's when your progesterone should be checked. And through the work that Amy's done, because she herself had issues with, she actually had, I believe it was recurrent pregnancy loss. Mm. And um, that one-time test is not sufficient to really understand your progesterone because it can adjust. And so theirs is more of a multi-day test and you can get the, the test on Amazon or off the Fem Power Health website. That's something that, you know, yes, it's done in the doctor's office, but we need to better understand that. What's also interesting is there's conflicting data about progesterone and how that impacts fertility. There was a big study called the Promise Trial out of the UK. And it, it's really interesting because I heard the doctor speak at the ASRM conference last year and then I recently looked to see what happened and he spoke very positively. And then they have like a very sad uh, email or on their website. And it says, you know, we are so sorry. Like we are shocked by these results, but it showed that progesterone doesn't necessarily impact. Uh, but then I've also heard that based on the way they did the clinical trial, it actually does matter when you provide the progesterone. So I say all this because, you know, it's not just get the test done, check, and you're done. <laughs> It's about getting these tests, understand how they, how the hormones relate to each other, and as a result, what that means for your specific body. And so I think that's the theme. So what specific tests? I think it's going to depend on the woman. And I think even in my journey early on when I didn't understand all of this, I mean, now I've been through like all the different diets and things like that. What I've learned is I know we have the Facebook groups where women say, you know, what did you do 
what worked for you. And we actually have a survey where we're trying to capture that more broadly for women so that we have general trends with statistical significance behind it on what worked for people for different conditions. But I do want to caution that even with our data, what you see on Facebook, you still have to know you. And so this is where like some of the things that your organization does, where it really digs a lot deeper. You know, as far as other testing, another thing to be aware of is the different clinics test different things just to get your baseline. So I have seen things like the HSG and the transvaginal ultrasound being consistent around the country. But the things that I don't see consistent are the genetic testing. So I learned a really interesting thing. And again, this is not an N of 10,000 because we're working on getting the survey filled out, but just from our qualitative interviews in New York City, because I went to so many fertility clinics, I can attest as an example that Fragile X um, had to be tested. So I always had to walk around with my Fragile X results to all the fertility clinics because they wouldn't see me unless I got tested. But then in North Carolina, I spoke to a patient and she said that um, it wasn't until she had multiple miscarriages that they tested for it. So it was part of her miscarriage panel. And so I think, you know, I want women to know too, that if you are having recurrent pregnancy loss, there is this thing called a a miscarriage panel or, you know, recurrent pregnancy loss test that they, they do to try to figure out if there's themes for that. So it's not even just the baseline, but, you know, if there's something going on, there's all these things that can be looked at for you. And so I just want women to be aware that there is a, a very, you know, deep hole you can dig into to be able to get answers. Um, and maybe deep hole is not the right word, but you know, there's a depth that you can go to deeper than just these baseline tests. And then the AMH too, where I think people are, you know, when I was going through this, they didn't have that. So it's FSH and, yep. and basically saying, you know, POF, that's how they're diagnosing it with the high FSH. Um, and I yep. didn't have any of the other genetic components of this. I'm glad you brought up AMH. Do you mind if I just speak to yeah, that real go quick? For it. One of the things I, I do want to, to bring up is with egg freezing now being ethically permissible, there's a lot of push for egg freezing. There's egg freezing clinics. I know one of them shut down, but you know another one of them has just raised, I think, $33 million yeah, in funding so to continue going. And that was um, Kind Body. Mm-hmm. Um, but then a lot of the fertility clinics are really starting to expand into that space. I believe their focus is just testing the antrofollicle count, which is through the transvaginal ultrasound, but then also the AMH. I'm not 100% sure. Well, I should say this. Um, they may not, because I haven't called every single clinic, they may not test for all of your hormones. And that's fine for egg retrieval um, because they, the point of egg retrieval is to understand how many do you have so that they can determine you know, the amount of eggs they'll likely be able to freeze for you. But I want women to understand just because you freeze your eggs, it doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get pregnant because again, you have to solve for the root cause. And yes, you know, even Amy Raup, who we interviewed for our um, podcast recently, you know, she even says like, yep, you know, I've got patients where they're fine and it's straight up, you know, I work with them on the side, they go to the fertility clinic and they literally just need to get the egg and sperm to make an embryo. They get the transfer and they're ready to go. But then there's a lot of people who just need a lot more help. And I just want to make sure people don't oversimplify the definition of egg freezing. Um, I can't tell you how many women used all of their frozen eggs and never got pregnant. And again, we don't know the data of how often this happens yet because they don't have to report the egg freezing data yet. Um, It's not mandatory like they do with uh, regular IVFs. Again, just want to caution women. And I'm not saying don't have hope, but just please be aware of what the possibilities are. And I know we all think it's never going to be me. I'm going to get pregnant on my first IVF. But considering it takes 2.3 IVFs on average to get pregnant, we just, we really need to be aware. Yeah, it's a false sense of security, I think, because it's, it's and it, you know, AMH is not testing your egg quality quantity. So it's really the, people can get pregnant with a zero AMH. AMH is really more of an indicator of how well you do it on your IVF. So I think some people, they're told, especially if you've been told if you have low AMH or POF or diminished ovarian reserve and, you know, donor eggs are for you and that that number on your AMH gets embedded in your heart and soul and you're, you don't even believe it's going to work, which is not the case. 
So in the functional side of things, we will dig deeper and we help people get pregnant with premature ovarian failure with an AMH of 0.08. Like it's those those numbers can be a, a well-meaning doctor is, is telling you those numbers, but it's not it's not the whole the whole case to really dig deeper. Exactly. Um, and then also some thyroid testing. Now I'm typically seeing people are not getting a full panel. What are, what are you seeing as initial, initial testing out there? Just a TSH then? Yes. Just, I, I hear more often than not in all the people that I'm talking to, it is, uh, there's a lot of stories out there that it is simply just TSH. And again, just given the disagreement about what normal is, I, I'll tell you, I recently went to my OBGYN and um, it was a very interesting conversation. So she said, I just test TSH. I said, well, can't you test everything else? She said, no, if your TSH is abnormal, I'll refer you to an endocrinologist. And I'm like, are you legally allowed to test the rest of it? And she got really frustrated with me and said that she would, but that it wasn't necessary. And I had spoke to her about the fact that there's disagreement on what the normal TSH is. And I said, so what do you consider normal? And her response was, it depends on what the lab says. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is just more of a, 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 an example to sh- bring it to light on what happens. Um, and I honestly felt like I was a mean patient. Like, how dare I stand up to my doctor? Um, even though I know this is what happens, but even I was like, what, should I have asked? And, and I know I should have. I had every right to, but I, I even, and this was a woman. And so it was, it was really frustrating, but it's, it's not just me. I hear this so often. Yeah. It's really a grassroots movement here. Well, basically the doctors are your partner. They're, you know, they're not the, the almighty God that, that are, you know, they, they're educated in their field, but they don't know your body and, or what's best for your body. And they are your, to be included on your team. And, you know, if they're blocking you from getting tests that you're looking for, then to me, it's time to look for another doctor. If you're, you're you know, if your doctor is not you're asking this information to be informed about your health. And we ask people when we're, when we're doing a blood chemistry review and it's ours is not to diagnose, it's to educate. We're looking at blood chem um, at reference ranges for functional ranges, which are for healthy people. The conventional range ranges are outdated. They're, they're, they're for people with disease. And so, so that the health, the, the functional range will flag it earlier. And sometimes when they go to ask for the, the, the blood work that we're looking for, they get, they get that response. They're just dismissed. And you, you start to you know, second guess yourself and you're like, wait a minute, we're able to access that, that, that information for people. But it is frustrating when you're trying to collect information on your body and you're being blocked. No, absolutely. And you know, when I uh, interviewed Dr. Allison McGregor about her book and TED Talk, what was interesting is she said, and she's an ER doctor who essentially started uh, sex and gender practice at Brown University, and obviously is now um, well known for this and making some serious changes. But even she said, "Look, you know, gone are the days of doctor knows best. Your doctor is your consultant. You need to do the research and go in with information prepared about you." And we put some um, information trackers on our website that women can leverage. I'm sure you have tools like that as well. And it's just really important to track information, even if it's things you don't think are a big deal. Um, you should track the information and you know be able to share that with your doctor and let them advise you. But they're not, they just, they have too many things that they need to know. It's hard for them to know anything expertly. And nowadays with such short doc- doctor appointments, okay. it is impossible for them to just immediately react to things you talk about um, and like guess what they need to ask you. Absolutely. So, okay. So basically the testing, we're looking at the estradiol, the FSH, the LH, progesterone, thyroid, AMH. We talked about the, the ultrasounds so the pelvic ultrasound. Did you talk about uh, HSG? I did bring up HSG. I didn't get into it in detail, but essentially that just makes sure that your tubes are open. Some women find it painful, but it's an important test to get done because you do want to make sure that your tubes are open. And then there's other things that can be done like laparoscopy and yeah. things like that. But it's, it's you know, the, the basic ones are, you know, what I had shared and then mm-hmm. there's a lot more that can be done. So, you know, I, I, I'm curious on your thoughts. Like what I would say to women is get the basics done and, you know, again, the reason why you were mentioning the ages of if you've been 
trying for over a year and you're over 35 versus six months if you're sorry over a year and you're under 35 and six months or more if you're over 35 that's just because the definition of infertility is based on that the biggest regret that people express is they waited too long so i would definitely recommend that time mark and then go to your doctor and get tested i will say that there's a lot of testing now that you can do at home you know just remember that it's not everything that needs to be tested. So I think it would be a good indicator, but I don't think it would fully define what uh, issues you may have, if you have any at all. Um, but I think, you know, just having awareness so that when it's time to go to the doctor, you can at least get the baselines. But then if you've been monitoring things closely, there may be additional things you can bring to the doctor that triggers having more done in advance. And then also, I, I think what's important to bring up is even with the work you're doing, naturopaths and acupuncturists and possibly nutritionists, especially if you have PCOS, are really good people to have on your team because the REIs and the OBGYNs are going to have a very specific perspective. Another interesting tip I learned as far as like where you go to understand what's going on with you and then also where to go to get procedures should you need that is if a a fertility clinic is positioning themselves as an IVF clinic, be very careful because what I have found is kind of like the theory we say a surgeon's going to want to do surgery and IVF doctor's going to want to do IVF. And I do find that it, it just seems like people get pushed quickly. And I'm sure the intention is, you know, women, you know, as we get older, you know, it, it does impact egg quality and success rates of IVF based on the data that, that they've collected. So they probably want to try to help you as quickly as possible. But I'm sure you can even speak to many patients that you've helped that maybe were about to do an IVF that didn't need it. Um, so there's just, it's, it's very complex. <laughs> but, you know, bottom line, as I am saying a lot here is watch what's going on, monitor, go to your doctor, as soon as you know there's a concern and it will be covered by insurance if you wait the appropriate six months or a year based on your age if you're worried get the at-home test just to kind of get an idea of what's going on with you and you know build as much of a team as possible to support you um to be able to get different perspectives and a holistic view on your body yeah to me it's important to get to get these tests to get a baseline and make sure there's nothing that's you know structurally that's been been missed. So making sure you're getting those, those tests is important. And then in the functional side thing, we're digging deeper, like with an IVF. Yeah, there is pressure to be pushed potentially to IVF, you know, earlier than is necessary to me. I think unless you tried the functional approach, IVF is, is your last step. You know, IVF was developed for people that um, have blocked tubes. And now, you know, there's other reasons that you may need to use it. If there's a genetic abnormality, or if obviously if there's and cancer or there's other issues that I'm you know potentially missing here but in general I think it's way over prescribed and it's extremely expensive with the as you're saying 2.5 to 3 cycles for it to work an average cost of $60,000 so it's a huge investment when there's other things you can you can do beforehand to optimize it and what about tests for the men you get sperm and semen analysis yeah, so I, I guess maybe to step back on why the men need to be tested. Like, I, here's what I will say: what what I found is if you like, I didn't have to go through the journey of figuring it out because I was told right away go to a fertility clinic. I hear so often how men do not get tested until later, and the women are looked at first. And a lot of that is, and it, I actually interviewed uh, Dr. Paul Gittens on men's sexual health. And I did that interview because uh, at the ASRM conference, one of the doctors said that the data shows men go to the doctor when their mother, sister, or wife tells them to. But women, you know, we have our OBGYN appointment and it's been drilled into our heads since we were teenagers that we have to go every year. And so I think when you just look at the uh, stigma and culture and everything else, women just go to the doctor more. And I, I don't know if that's what influenced why women get looked at so critically when it comes to fertility treatments. But, you know, we cannot underestimate that, you know, some of the cases are due to men. And it's, I, I've seen anywhere from 30 to 50%. I don't know what numbers you've seen. Yeah, I used to be 60, um, 40, and now I'm seeing 50, 50. Yeah. So, we can't underestimate that it could be an issue with the men. And if you're at a fertility clinic, they do tend to test the men right away, especially if they're doing the IVF. 
But if you're before that stage, they don't always do that. And what's confusing to me though, is there are women who've been down the road. I don't understand why the men get tested later. So that's something I'm, I'm not really clear on. But you know, at the, at the very least, they do want to test the semen and they test for the volume, the sperm count, the concentration, the motility, which is how the sperm move, and the morphology, which is the shape of the sperm. And that's your basic test. But then they, you know, they can do other things like a scrotal ultrasound, um, testing for hormones, genetics, a testicular biopsy. Mm-hmm. They can look at post-ejaculation urinalysis, transrectal ultrasound, sperm function tests. There are a lot of tests that they can do, but those often don't get done until they're necessary. I think um, you know, also a basic physical exam of the man. So the, the, the semen test and the physical exam are number one and mandatory and should be done in all cases when you're starting out. And there are some at-home tests that men can do as well. So that space is really starting to grow in the past Mm -hmm. few years. And what I'm hearing doctors when I've asked them about these tests, and I'm curious, you know, what you've heard too, is um, it seems that whenever you're doing these at-home tests, a lot of people are saying that they're directionally okay, but you cannot assume... Um, you can't make too many assumptions based on the results just because it's not everything that needs to be looked at to give you an answer. And so, right. yep, go ahead. Yeah, it might just be looking at count rather than uh, motility, morphology. So being other exactly. things are being missed. Exactly. And so, you know, just know that if you're doing it, it gives you one piece of the information, but these are all the things that that need to look at. So again, you know, the volume count, concentration, motility, and morphology are all important. And to your point, not all of that can be done in the at-home test. And so let's talk about why it's important to make a plan and really be informed when you first start trying to conceive. Might sound. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I'm typically coaching type A's who are planners. So if you're going into overdrive with a plan, that's a whole other thing. But but really being informed and, and like, wait a minute, what do I need to do kind of on my journey? Because it sounds like for both of us, I was just diagnosed and said donor eggs and I didn't get a second opinion. I didn't even look at any of my, my, my health and not until years later did the, the health crisis come. And I was completely ill-informed and just was lucky enough to be lucky enough for me for, you know, that it worked. Then years later had that, that, that the health crisis thing. So yeah, why is it important to make a plan? Yeah. And, you know, here's what I will say about the plan is, you know, to your point, I think you and I both went in very educated women. I think when both you and I started, the social media and things like that didn't exist. But I think the social media may not always paint an accurate picture because it's the way people are sharing their stories. But at the very least, it's creating awareness. So thank thank goodness that that's there. But I think it also may create stress and, stress and confusion. So let's acknowledge that. It's It's really what I would say the role of the planning is, is before you get started, because it becomes an emotional ride. And I will say I made a lot of really dumb decisions because I didn't know what I was getting into. And you know, at the time, all the decisions made sense. But now looking back, now that I'm not in the mix of it all, I realized they were reactionary decisions. And that probably also led to some of the delays. And so the planning is really you know, financial, um, understanding, like on our website, we have like different ways that you can fund your fertility treatment. So if you do need to go that route, I guess for a start with like, what is your budget and what's going to be covered? And it's not to say you are already going to do a fertility treatment. You may not, but I think really trying to figure out what your options are and what you're willing to do. And even things like, would you, if things didn't work out, consider donor egg or adoption or donor sperm or donor embryo or a surrogate? And, you know, if you'd have a surrogate, that's a huge cost. That's like at least a hundred grand. And so these are all the things that come into play and the road could be endless. I mean, thank goodness it's not the majority, but it does happen. And you don't always know what's going to happen to you. Like one woman I befriended actually in my fertility clinic's office, 
she ended up having this very interesting genetic condition where she actually wrote her, an article in the Wall I think it was Wall Street Journal or Washington Post. She ended up having to go to a surrogate because she had a boy as her first kid. And it turned on this gene where she could not carry a child ever again mm. because she would miscarry. And, you know, so you just, you just never know what's going to happen to you. And again, these numbers are small, but, you know, I think planning the finances, planning your boundaries, and it's not to say those are finite, but I think what they do gives you boundaries so that when you're in this emotional state, you can make better decisions. And I think upfront too, part of the planning is who's going to be on your team. Like if you're looking for an acupuncturist, we interviewed Dr. Mark Sklar mm -hmm. and uh, on our podcast, and he talks about a website that you can go on to see which acupuncturists are actually trained in women's reproductive health. And so it's not just look at your insurance plan, find an acupuncturist, make sure they're covered and you're done. You know, that's going to be an additional cost because a lot of the um, top ac acupuncturists do not accept insurance. And, you know, then like if you have PCOS, you're probably going to have mental health, you know, things that you're going to have to deal with. So that's an additional cost. There's the medications, there's the supplements. So, you know, it's like the cost, the time it's going to take, how are you going to go to your multi, you know, week appointments and make sure that you're getting all the testing done? And, you know, can you take enough vacation? So, there's the logistics of it, the financial, the building the right team part and not doing it when you're rushing. And here's another bit of advice about the planning. A couple of months is not going to make a difference. I know we all feel that ticking time that the doctors keep reminding us of, but it is much better to wait a couple of months, get your eggs healthy, you know, take that 90 days to get them healthy and get your body healthy and take that time to plan, take care of yourself, then begin refreshed and renewed. Like if I were to tell myself 10 years ago what to do, that is what I wish I would have said. I still wonder to this day if I would have gotten pregnant on my own, if I hadn't, hadn't been told day one, rush off to the fertility clinic because I went there and they right away said, you need to do IVF. And this doctor I'd never met before comes in and sticks the transvaginal ultrasound into my vagina and says, okay, we're ready for IVF. He never mm. said hello, never introduced himself. I mean, just imagine <laughs> the trauma yeah. of that. And you know, the planning could have potentially saved me. So it's really, really important to think through all those pieces. I love that. So the, looking at the budget, looking at the time this is going to take, assembling your team, and then, yes, yeah, so we talk about a lot of like working on the basics, because if you haven't got your diet, your sleep, your movement, your stress and check going through with that IVF, I mean, it doesn't make sense. So we're right. not working on those, those basics. And a lot of times, you know, the, the fertility clinic may, you know, tell you not to drink alcohol or caffeine or stop smoking weed, um, but they don't really dig into other things that can, that can help optimize success. So like those base, if I speak to so many people all the time that, you know, how's your sleep? Not good. Well, that's a huge glue to dig deeper. Oh yeah. And so you can, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You can't out supplement, you can't, you know, you can't out supplement a bad diet, poor sleep, all, all those. And if you're super stressed, especially if you've been told, you know, from, from the get go that this is the, the path you have to take, there's a lot of an enormous stress, you know, with an infertility diagnosis to begin with. And then, you know, as you're rushed along into the, with the fertility clinic side of things, the stress with that on your, on your, your relationship, how it impacts um, all aspects of your life. So really, if you, if IVF is for you, you need really getting someone to support you with the uh, stress side of things, mindset, self-care is key. You know, exactly. And I don't want to um, underplay the diet. I mean, even in my own journey you know, I had to stop gluten and dairy with the endometriosis diagnosis. And since then I've just really gotten deep into the self-care route. And it's, it's been like a, maybe a couple of years now where I just am like, oh my gosh, food. I cannot believe the impact of food. It is, it is unbelievable. Um, as Amy Raup says uh, in our podcast, food is medicine. And she's right. Like it is, you know, I know we, 
are in a society where we mindlessly eat, you know, the cookies and drink the alcohol and, and do things like that. But it is, it is not a joke. And I'm not saying, okay, everyone go on an elimination diet, but to your point, like if you're not sleeping well, <laughs> and you're doing all these things, like you might want to consider an elimination diet because, you know, there could be some things in your diet. Like for me, my nose runs when I eat red meat, if I eat too much sugar, I'm, uh, I look overweight, but it's actually almost like a bloating where if I just cut out the sugar, I lose like five pounds in a week, not because I'm starving myself, but it's like this extra bloat that just sits on my body. So it, it's just, it's fascinating what food does. It's just crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we are suggesting that if, if you're trying to conceive both you and your partner go on an elimination diet, said uh, 10 days, take out the top allergens and then systematically reintroduce them and really figure out how food impacts your body is the, the gold standard. So definitely uh, look at that. We have an episode how and why to do the elimination diet and why that matters for fertility. So, um, but yeah, like it is really to, to dig into that piece. You know, what we place on our fork every day does matter. It's a huge piece that I think a lot of people um, get wrong, including myself for years. It's been yep. figured out for years. So I know. And that's why I'm, I'm right. And, and that's why I'm so enjoying talking to you because you definitely get it. And and are helping so many women with um, the work that you guys do in the coaching because it's really, really needed. And um, I wish your your organization had started while I was trying to conceive. I mean, I, luckily, I I finally did get pregnant with my one son, but um, it is it's a journey, and um, you really have to dig deep. and And I, I do want to say too, like, um, there's some really great books out there. Like, it starts with the egg. And I just want to acknowledge the women who are posting on that particular Facebook group, like, I did this and I didn't get pregnant. Why not? It's an oversimplification. Like, yes, those things that she recommends in the book are great, but it's not personalized. So yes, those are great things to do to get to a baseline. And probably every woman should try to do that. But I think it's, a, you know, as hopefully people hear through the discussion Sarah and I had today that... It's, it's not that simple. Like you can't go to a book, check, did it, assume pregnancy next month. It's, it's <laughs> unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, that's why I recorded an episode, what to do next after you've read it starts with the A because I saw so many people saying, but I've read the book and I've implemented all these changes and it's still not working. Well, from the that's functional awesome. side of things, I like take apart that book and there's a lot of really good things in that book, but there's a lot of, it's very generalized, like you're saying, generalized recommendations and we take it all apart and really how, you know, what is missed and, and taking a functional spin on that book. So I really encourage you to listen to that episode. I will. No, I will. Because I have definitely listened to so many of your episodes. And I just, I think they're so informative and fantastic. And I did not know about this episode. And I'm giggling at the title, but That's I love funny. it. And I, <laughs> and I will definitely check that one out for sure. Awesome. And then, so we had talked about emotional support. And really, you know, this is to me is key as well, because we can, you know, go gluten free and dig into all the food sensitivities, address the gut infections, throw out the plastics, uh, you know, drink purified water. But if we have not got our emotional stuff together, um, that is a huge uh, stressor on the body. And really, there's so many triggers on this journey. Uh, and you talked about assembling your team, how important this is. Can you talk a little bit about emotional support and how uh, important that is? I would love to. So I think the first thing is I would love for no woman to isolate. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you that even 10 years ago when people were being secretive about their fertility treatments... Every single person I talked to either was going through fertility issues, did go through them, or knew of someone. It was insane. Like I, I got to the point where I'm like, is everyone in this country infertile and the data is just wrong? Oh. Um, and so you're not alone. And yes, there's Instagram to remind you that you're not alone. And that has changed in the past decade. But you know, if you're not comfortable talking to family or friends, there's social workers that specialize in this area. There's psychologists and psychiatrists who also can specialize in this area. But I, I wouldn't beat yourself up. Look, I, I'm not going to... So first of all, acknowledge your feelings. So I don't want to deny your feelings. But what I would say is it is okay to feel what you feel. Please don't hide. Like whatever you're comfortable with, find the support. I'm back and forth on sharing these examples because I don't want to scare women. I more just want to share the reality. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully people take this the, the right way. So I was going through some 
personal issues in my marriage. I found out on a really rough, rough, impactful day in my uh, life that I had a chemical pregnancy after I had my son. And it was with the youngest embryos that I had frozen. And they were from the first year of my fertility journey. Now I got pregnant with my own eggs, fresh eggs at 40. Um, and I was, it was the most horrific time probably in my life. And to this day, I cry when I think about it because had I been off the IVF hamster wheel, um, I would have said, who cares that I have a transfer scheduled? My life is falling apart. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't because I was like, I'm on a schedule. I have it scheduled. I'm going to do it. And then I get a chemical pregnancy and now I'm done. I'm 46. It, it's over. And I mean, I, I shouldn't say over, over because there are women who get pregnant at 48, but given, you know, the mm -hmm. dynamics, it's likely over, right? And then when I reached out to my fertility doctor to tell him what was going on, he shared how many women were going through struggles in their relationship because of the fertility treatments. And the stories he was telling me, I was like, whoa, really? I had no idea. And so I just, I just want to acknowledge the women who are listening to this and maybe later in their journey who are really struggling with you know, their relationship and, you know, struggling with whether or not to do that IVF, like have the support. If you're like really stressed out and freaking out, just because something's scheduled, you don't have to do it. You could wait another month. You could wait another six months, especially if you have frozen embryos and you're not in a health situation where you have to get, do the transfer right away. Like, the doctors have told me I could get pregnant when I'm 50 if I wanted to because I had the frozen embryos and my body can take the pregnancy. The impact, I just, I guess I just wanted to share this so you all understand the impact if you don't take care of your mental health. Just make sure you have people you can talk to and talk to in a vulnerable, honest way if you're really struggling. But also don't wait until you get to the point I got to and some of these other women. Like if you're seeing the signs early on of, of stress, um, handle it in some way that you feel like you can trust the people because it's so important. Um, so, so important. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think it's really important for people to hear because uh, like I coach so many busy professionals, type A's that, are, and I'd be the same. Oh wait, I have the, I have the thing I have to go. And I did that after we had our daughter, we had two embryos left, left over. I, I had this planned vision that I wanted to have my kids close together. And after a year I went in and I was like, so like uptight, uptight and stressed out about it and it didn't work. And then we had to go on a list for a separate donor. And so it is really, and it's hard, like it's because our we've pushed down our intuition. We are listening to outside sources. We're consulting everyone else except ourselves as to what's right. And if there's things going on in your life to be able to listen to those signs and like listen to yourself, listen to your body. And, and it's not, it's sometimes taking you know, two or three steps back to take a huge giant leap forward. And, um, and that's why we coach couples because this does, it's so, it can really tear a marriage apart or bring you together. And so, you know, women typically are the ones that are starting to, you know, the Instagram profiles and, and maybe sharing with, with, you know, with a few friends, men don't typically, you know, stereotypically don't, don't tell anyone. So, and doesn't mean that they're not equally in pain. So it is, having a conversation with the two of you and people are, you know, people share and the, the couples coaching things they've never even shared with each other. And it just opens up this dialogue because we tend to step this shit down and we don't, you know, and once you let it out, that's when the healing starts to happen. I just think it's important to, to listen to yourself. And I, I know for years I was always like, I mean, what does everyone else think I should do? Well, no, what do I want to do? No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are some, uh, is there a book or a website or an app, a documentary, anything that you are obsessed with right now? You've, you have recommended a number of resources along the way, but anything else that's coming to mind? So the, the one book I, I refer to so much, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. The Period Repair Manual. Yes. Have you read that one? Yeah, I read it right there. Yeah, that is, that is one of my all-time favorites because she really gets into just, it, it's not just about the period. It's, it's really 
about women's health and a lot of these conditions and how you can treat it. And what I love is there's a couple of conditions. She's like, this is out of the realm of, you know, anything we can discuss here. You'd have to go to a specialist for this. But she talks about a lot of natural things and even, you know, pharmaceutical products and uh, medications that you should try. And she talks about the pros and cons and about how diet can help. And just really more like a detective work. And in the back, she's got questions that you should be asking your doctor. And she does it by condition. And she she says she phrases the questions so that the doctor isn't like, well, whatever. Like, where did you hear that dumb idea from? And so she makes sure to phrase the questions so that when you go in, the doctor is not, you know, frustrated with you and dismissing you. So I think that's a great book. I think every woman should start out with taking charge of your fertility Mm -hmm. um, because that really explains how the body works and the hormones and the tracking. And so even if you're not going to be doing all the detailed tracking, which I think every woman should at least for a few cycles to get to another cycle, it just helps you understand how the pieces fit together. Um, It is an incredible book. If you do have to do an elimination diet and you're annoyed with having to do it, I would recommend Amy Raup's Body Belief. She really talks about the upfront and the rationale for why it's important. And she even says, like, if you're just going to do this diet as a checkbox, don't bother. I need you to understand why you're doing it deep in your soul so that, you know, this is not just to check the box. And then once you're done with the diet, you go back to doing what you were doing before. And so she just does a really great job of like explaining it all. So those would be, and then also if you want to check out um, Dr. Allison McGregor's Sex Matters, just to better understand how medicine works and how different medications impact women versus men, it is an absolutely fascinating read. She talks about it on our podcast as well, if you don't have time to read the book. And then there's actually, I'm forgetting the name, so I'll have to get it for you after, but there's a book I'm reading right now. Actually, I'll try to look at it on my phone about recurrent pregnancy loss. It is by Dr. Laura Shaheen. She basically breaks down like all the different things around miscarriage and recurrent pregnancy loss, the tests, um, et cetera. And she's going to be on our podcast as well. Um, that'll come out in October for recurrent pregnancy loss awareness month. And, but her book is great too. Like it really walks you through the basics. And apparently a lot of the women who've had miscarriages wishes they had this guide beforehand. And it's not a very long book, but it is very informative. So I would say those are my, those are the ones that are on top of mind right now. Amazing. Yeah. We had uh, Dr. Lara uh, Bryden on the podcast, the uh, period repair manual. So definitely I uh, can check out that episode. And yeah, the taking charge of your fertility is, is kind of the Bible there to figuring out your, your, um, your cycle. And it is, yeah, really your period is a indicator of your health. And if there's something going on there to really, you know, another good book on that is Lisa Hendrickson Jack, who's the host of Fertility Friday. She has the fifth vital sign, which is your period. So look at that. And yeah, Amy wraps a rope to a rope route. Yeah. To look in at the intention. Cause when you're doing the elimination diet, you're like, this sucks. You really need to dig into, well, why, like, why am I doing this? And then that kind of helps you to, to stay the course. And um, yeah, I think you've, you've got on your site there, you've got a nice list of uh, books to check out there. So Fem, Empower Health, you can check it out. Is there a success story or anything you'd like to share with us? Based on the uh, the story I said I shared um, around what I was going through with that chemical pregnancy, mm-hmm. I, I think this is a perfect good story. So it's a dear friend of mine, and she wrote a post about it. Um, so I, I feel okay sharing this. She uh, she very publicly speaks about her situation. So she got married to an older man, and he had had a vasectomy, and the reversal did not work very well. So they were going through IVF and she went through one and it failed. And then she was in the middle of going through another one and he changed his mind about wanting to have kids. And she was, you know, in her late thirties, I think. And she had to make a decision. Do I leave my husband uh, to have a kid or do I stay married and not have a kid? She chose to leave him and she became a single mother by choice. And that's also a great organization for anyone out there choosing to be a single mom. She had her daughter and then she ended up meeting this man at a friend's 40th birthday party and he has two kids. And so now she is a family of three and uh, the two girls are the same age and then they have um, her stepson and they're just so happy. He is such a wonderful man and they have this great little family 
and they just went to Disney together. And I'm getting chills as I'm telling this story. Um, I actually want to cry. Um, and she was so my inspiration when I was going through my fertility journey. Cause like, what a badass, you know, to choose yeah. between that. Um, and I just wanted to share that story because it can get that hard. Um, and your dreams can come true. It may not look the way you planned when you were 21 years old and graduating college with your list of all the things you were going to accomplish, but it worked out in a different and most perfect way. And she is so happy and he's such a great man and the kids are awesome. So um, I think that's such a great story to end on based on the example I gave about the tragedies that can happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. And, and so you have a survey here. It's at fempower-health.com, uh, health help hyphen other hyphen women.com. Uh, we'll have the link in the show notes. So basically this is a survey where you're collecting data. Um, and can you kind of explain this a little bit about the survey? And then there's some discount products that they'll receive there'll some products they can get at a discount when they complete the, the survey. What, what's Absolutely. the survey about? Yep. And you know, what I will say is, um, people that, you know, really understand what we're trying to do, they've actually said, this is not just your average survey. And, Again, given the lack of data around women's health and given that women go to each other anyways for the advice as their primary resource, we believe that if we can put data around that and have women share their stories and then report back. Um, but again, you know, we need women to fill that out to have statistical significance behind it. And again, it's the intention is not to say this is now your diagnosis or this is your treatment path. But what it does is it levels the playing field. So you can find out things like, oh, in North Carolina, Fragile X is part of the miscarriage panel, but in New York, it's done as part of your initial fertility. So I think it really levels the playing field around all the different things being done across the country and even the world. And so we we do encourage women to take that out. And again, to take it. And then um, as a thank you, we do have discount products. And then once in a while, we'll do um, some grand prize drawings as well. So we do encourage everyone to take it because it, I, I do hope it, it helps transform um, some of the information that's available to women. Also, so de- definitely go to the show notes and click on the survey link, leave your feedback because I think it says we're changing the conversation and changing women's health. It starts from women. So yeah, so thank, thank you so much for coming on, Georgie, sharing your words of wisdom on this topic. I think it's very um, impactful. So thanks again. Thank you, Sarah. It was a true pleasure. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. Honestly, it's, it's amazing. Awesome. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus, it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus, it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend Blue Blocks, Blue and Green Light sleep classes to all our one-to-one clients. Simply go to Blue Blocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the supercharger fertility discovery call is for action takers, really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you are a U.S. resident, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E to 55444. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to our heart. These simple yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. For U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E to 55444. For non-U.S. residents, go to Yoga Freebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E to access your special gift. That's yogafreebie.com to access the free fertility yoga download. 
The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.